In the 1920s and 30s, physics professor Moritz Schlick was at the center of a diverse group of thinkers in Vienna who met to discuss philosophy. They came to be known as the Vienna Circle, and included in their number Rudolf Carnap, Otto Neurath, and Kurt Gödel. It was at these meetings that logical positivism was born, one of the most profoundly influential movements of the 20th century. Logical positivism asserted that the only kind of sensical discourse was scientific. With its emphasis on sense and meaning, the Vienna Circle owed an obvious debt to Wittgenstein's early work. Uh, they did think that the details of Wittgenstein's uh, theory of meaningfulness uh, should be changed. They thought the logical system that he imposed was too narrow, and they thought that there was all sorts of metaphysical elements uh, in the statement of the theory which didn't need to be there. So they took it upon themselves to recast that general idea, and they came up with what's called the verificationist theory or criterion of meaning. And the idea was that statements come, meaningful statements come in essentially two classes. In one class, we have statements that are either true in virtue of meaning alone or false in virtue of meaning alone. And for these, you don't have to investigate the world at all in order to um, understand them or know them to be true or false. But the other class of meaningful statements, these are statements about the world, and these ought to be statements that could be verified or falsified by ordinary empirical observation. In 1929, the Vienna Circle published its manifesto, The Scientific Conception of the World, which advanced the view that the only meaningful statements were those that are either empirically verifiable or grounded in logic and mathematics. All else was deemed emotive. As a result, logical positivism held that the sentences of metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics were in fact not statements at all. The statements of ethics and aesthetics were either basic commands, thou shalt not kill, or basic exclamations of approval or disapproval, impressionism, boo, or cubism, hooray, and the statements of metaphysics were just plain meaningless. The propositions of metaphysics lack theoretical sense completely. They assert nothing. Nevertheless, they are useful to show an emotive attitude in life. In the uh, early part of the 20th century, the logical positivists argued that most metaphysical discourse is just meaningless. They had a criterion of meaningfulness for statements, uh, sometimes called the verification criterion. So the idea was that a statement is meaningful, cognitively meaningful, in the sense of can either be true or false, if and only if it's verifiable. And they claimed that uh, most metaphysical discourse was unverifiable. And the, the meaningful parts of metaphysical discourse was, were, were really just sort of definitionally true. Logical positivism rejected as illegitimate every statement about the world that was not based on direct experience. This position formed the basis of the verification principle. A sentence can be meaningful if and only if it is either empirically verifiable or it can be shown to be true by analyzing the conventional meanings of its signs or symbols. 
other words, understanding the meaning of a proposition now required that you know how to verify it. A sentence is only meaningful when we can verify it by experience, by some kind of, you know, uh, visual or auditory or whatever experience. When a sentence can't be verified, shown, proven, at least, made highly likely or something by experience, then it's meaningless and just really, literally has no meaning at all. It doesn't even get to be false. It gets to be no meaning. It's not that it's wrong, it's just, it's like when a cat purrs. That's not right or wrong, it's just a noise. Logical positivism had a tremendous impact on 20th century philosophy. And for many years, metaphysics was off the table as an area of serious philosophical study. However, when its premises were followed all the way to their logical conclusions, cracks began to appear in the edifice of their principle of verification. If logical positivists rigorously applied verificationist criteria for meaningfulness to physics, for example, they came up against enormous problems. If we say that every electron is thus and so, well, how would we directly observe that? It's not like we can look at them all. We might get little glimmers of evidence, but we couldn't directly observe its truth or falsity in any sort of way. And we can't even directly observe electrons, let alone all of them. So once again, it seems that um, uh, something's really going wrong. Their intention was not to throw out the whole of science. And in trying to fall, throw out uh, metaphysics, they ended up repeatedly finding themselves under pressure to throw out science too, which was not what they wanted. And they were never able to come up with a formulation of the principle that would sort the right things into the right baskets. They never were able to come up with a principle which put all the metaphysics and the other sort of bad, bad discourse in the one box and the good scientific discourse in the other box. The logical positivists held that scientific hypotheses could be reduced to what they called protocol statements, which are the basic reports of direct observation. These reports form the standard by which other empirical statements are to be tested. This view raised the question, didn't protocol statements themselves need to be verified? Otto Neurath held that they cannot be the starting point of the sciences, which led him to compare knowledge to a ship that has to be continually rebuilt, even while it is still at sea. Reconciling the objectivity of science with the subjectivity of personal experience presented a challenge to the Vienna Circle. If experience takes the form of private sense data, how can science achieve the attitude of detachment to which it aspires? Neurath and Rudolf Carnap tried to resolve this conflict with a revised version of materialism called physicalism. The aim of physicalism was to turn physics into the catalyst for unifying the sciences. It stated that everything that exists or happens can be completely described in the vocabulary of physics. Here, then, was the holy grail of logical positivism, a scientific language that could, theoretically, give voice to all the sciences. The problem was that they, when they asked themselves the question, what exactly do I mean by observation? What exactly do I mean when I say that this sentence is verified in this way or falsified in this way or could in principle be verified or falsified by this, that, or the other observation? They found that every time they tried to make these notions precise and clear, they ran up against failure. 
Uh, initially, their problems were they tried to make the notions of verification and falsification quite strong. And all sorts of sentences of science, which they regarded as the real paradigm of meaning, would then up, end up getting classified as meaningless. Uh, this was rightly, I think, regarded to be a disaster. So they're the two central themes that were at the basis of the positivist critique of metaphysics. Theme one, all necessity uh, amount, amounts to is truth by convention. And two, uh, meaningfulness is a matter of verifiability. And we might add maybe falsifiability. Being, uh, showable to be true or showable to be false by direct observation. So, both of those ideas were a threat to metaphysics. But what is interesting is, even within, you know, within not very long, it became very clear that both of those ideas were absolutely wrong. And there's, there's it's not going too far to say there's something of a consensus in contemporary Anglo-American philosophy. And, you know, I, I don't want to speak about that which I do not know, so I'll speak about Anglo-American philosophy. There's something of a consensus. Those ideas are just wrong-headed. 